All right, I think we are working. Let's wait a few minutes to get everybody going, and let me see if I can get this popped up on YouTube here so I can I can uh, see comments and stuff. Um, it's not that. You'd think after doing this two or three times, I'd have it figured out, but I still have not figured this thing out yet. Okay, let's see how it is. Hmm. 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 Okay, so that's that. Where is? Oh, there we go. Okay, so that's there. Starting now. Okay, everybody, we'll give people a few minutes just to join in. How's everybody doing? If somebody wants to test the comments, that would be fantastic so we can make sure that the chat feature is open so everybody can ask questions. I'm going to get situated here in my chair. And, all right, this looks like it's going. And it, okay, so it seems like we're having a little bit of a problem on YouTube. Let me adjust. Okay. Post that. Share that. So everybody knows how to get here. It's a lot of work to get all these things these things going. Okay. Where'd that just go? You guys can all see me, right? Can you guys all see me and hear me too? Everybody can see and hear me? Okay. Not sure what the delay is like on here. Okay, cool. Awesome. So I think there's probably there's probably about a minute delay, which seems like it's been what that's about what it's been in the past. So we will give everybody two more minutes to jump on here just because it sounds like we've been having some internet problems. And then we'll go. I'm going to keep my water handy. I tend to, tend to work up uh, my – tend to get a little parched during these things. <laughs> Bum, bum, bum. Okay, everybody can see and hear me. <laughs> yeah, there will be, I don't know if we're going to be getting the crowns tonight. Okay. So, one more minute and then we will get going. Oh, where did I just put this thing in? Okay. So we get the comments working. That's great.
How has everybody's day been? What's your highlight? What's been the highlight? I'm trying to figure out what the, our delay is here, just to see what time it takes to get everything there. It looks like we got a pretty good we got a pretty good crowd. I've seen I've seen Canada, I've seen Portugal, I've seen Spain, I've seen New Zealand, Denmark, Australia, United States, and many more. So I appreciate you all uh, you all making it because I know it's every somebody's different time everywhere else. So. All right, let's get this party started. How about that? So today is Wednesday, April 16th, and it is a little after 5.30 Pacific Time, California time. And tonight we're going to talk about the meaning we assign to things, a way to create an amazing spring. And I want to start off by, first of all, thanking everybody. As I just mentioned, we have a huge, it looks like a huge international contingency tonight. I know it is the middle of the night or the wee-wee hours for some of you. And I really, you know, I feel very blessed and honored that you guys would choose to get up in the middle of the night or stay up really late to spend the time with me. And I promise you this will be worthwhile. And it's always a, it's always a blast for me to have so many different people from so many different parts of the world join in on these chats. Um, some, we, a couple of you mentioned that there were some problems with the links to uh, the links of getting into the getting onto the the chat. So if you don't mind sharing it with your friends, put it on your page. You know, I said dogs and cats are allowed tonight, so make sure they're here too. And I'm sure we're going to have some people trickling as we go. It looks like I have about a one minute delay or so from you guys, and that's about what it's been in the past, and I will try to be conscientious of that. Okay, without further ado, let's get going, because I know it's late for a lot of you. Tonight's topic is how to create an amazing spring, and the focus of doing that is the meaning we assign to things. The meaning that we assign to things. And I want to start off tonight by telling you all a little story that I heard this last weekend, and it's a, it's a cool little story, and I think it really it, it really illustrates this point. Once upon a time, you know, all good stories start with once upon a time. Once upon a time, there was this lady, and she was known for making this fantastic roast. Just, you know, one of those ones that it, it literally gets you salivating from, from the taste of it. You can smell it, and you're even thinking, oh, man, how delicious that is. Oh, you know, before I get into the story, a couple housekeeping things. Be sure you stay to the very end because I'm going to have a little surprise, you know, opportunity for those of you who want to take advantage of it who are here the whole time. And also, I encourage you all to take notes as I'm talking, and then if you could, write down your questions as we come along. Once I get to the Q&A time at the end, we can start asking questions. I will talk for probably about 20 minutes, 15 to 20 minutes in there, and then we'll open it up for question and answers. There's going to be a lot of uh, side talk with the comments coming up, and so if they're circulating through a lot, I can get distracted, as you all know, for those of you who have been here before. So it really helps me to write things down, or for you to write them down and then ask at the end when there's questions. And again, you guys, I really encourage you to take notes so that you can ask questions as um, you can come back to things if you need to. Okay, with that being said, back to the story. There's this lady, and she's, she's notorious for making this unbelievable roast, right? And it's one of those roasts that when it comes out of the oven, you just are... You, I mean, you have to be held back to, from diving into it. You know, it's it's epic roast, and it takes however long to cook, and the whole time you're just sitting there smelling it, and your mouth is watering, just the idea of getting to the point when you can eat it. So one day this lady's husband comes up and asks her about it, and she has this really unusual way of making it. She What she would do is she cuts off the ends of the roast first. So she cuts off the right side, she cuts off the left side, and then puts the roast in the oven like that. <clears throat> and she, he asked her, he said, well, honey, you know, why do you do that? It just it makes the roast taste so amazing. You know, what's, what's the secret behind it? And she said, well, 
it's been a family recipe. It's been in the family for a long time, and it's just how my mom always taught me. And he goes, well, well, what's the point behind it? And she said, I don't know. This is just what I learned, but it makes an amazing roast, doesn't it? And he said, well, yeah, it does. It makes a really amazing roast. And, she, and he goes, I really want to know what the secret is, why, how that benefits it so much. She goes, I don't know, but it's the secret. It's, it's the key to making the roast as amazing and delicious as it is. It's something about cutting the ends off that it helps release more, more of the nutrients inside and it allows the meat to air out. And it just helps it cook so much better. And she's explaining all these things to him. And he's sitting there nodding. He's oh, okay, that makes a lot of sense. And he goes, well, what else? And she goes, I don't know. You know, you should ask my mom. And he said, that's a great idea. So a couple days later, he comes over, stops over at the mom's house, her mom's house, his wife's mom's house, his mother-in-law. And he says, hi, Mrs. So-and-so. And I, I had a question for you. You know, my wife, your daughter, she makes this amazing roast that she said you taught her how to do, and she cuts the ends off every time. And I really want to know why she does that, because the roast is unbelievable. What, what's the secret? What was, your, what was your reasoning behind it? She, she says that the reason the roast is as good as it is is because of cutting the ends off, and it does all these things. It releases the nutrients. It allows the meat to breathe more. It does all this stuff. You know, is that true? What was your reasoning behind it? How did you discover it? And she looks at him and says, well, I didn't come up with that. He goes, what do you mean you didn't come up with it? And he, she, she says, well, it was my mom that came up with it. That's just how I've always done it. She taught me how to do it. And it's, it is. It's delicious. And he says, your mom? And he, she says, yes. He goes, okay. A couple days later, he's over at grandma's house. So this is his wife's grandma's house. And he talk, starts talking to her and he says, you know, grandma, the roast is unbelievable. Your, your granddaughter, my wife, she can't quite explain what the reasoning was behind cutting the ends off. But she attributes the success of how delicious the roast is, how moist it is, how, how mouth-watering it is to cutting the ends off before it goes in. She said it's a family recipe that was passed down from her mom. I talked to your daughter, your, and she didn't know what it was. She said, I need to come and talk to you. So what's the secret? Why does cutting the ends off this roast make for such an unbelievable, unbelievable delicious experience? And the grandma looks at him and she says, well, to be honest, I don't know. And he's like, what do you mean you don't know? How can you not know? You know, this was your tradition. You started off. Your daughter watched you do it. My wife, my, your granddaughter, she said she watched her mom do it. They said they watched you do this over and over again. They said this is the reason. And it, it does all these wonderful things to the meat. And, da, 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 da. and she looks at him and says, well, hmm, that may be true. But the reason that I cut the ends off the roast is because my oven was so small, I had to chop the ends off to get it to fit in the oven. And the guy looks at her and he says, wait, what? And she says, yeah. And she said, I just, it wouldn't fit in the oven, so I had to chop the ends off. And he said, so you mean to tell me that there's no real reason or science or logic behind cutting the ends off this meat? You just did it to get it to fit in the oven? And she said, "Yeah." She said, "Well, how come my wife? How come my wife? Are, how come my wife is attributing all the success to this? How come she says that it airs out the meat and it does all the it does all these nutrient things and it makes it so moist and everything else?" And Grandma says, "I don't know. I just wanted to get it to fit in the oven." Okay. The point of that story is is oftentimes in life, in culture, in family storytelling, and etc. Things happen. We have experiences, and we don't know what the reason for it necessarily was, but we attach a meaning to something. In this story, the grandma had a roast, and she needed a practical problem solved. She needed to get this piece of meat in her oven. The only way she could do it is if she chopped the ends off, and then it was able to sit in the oven. From that, her family took the meaning of it to be that that was some secret recipe, that the key to making an amazing roast was cutting the ends off. Nothing to do with the seasoning, nothing to do with the way they cooked it, nothing to do with any of that stuff. She was just trying to get it to fit, and over time, the meaning of it went on to being that was the key to the success of the delicious roast. I share this story with you as a preface to what we're going to talk about today, because in life, everything that happens to us, everything that we experience, we assign a meaning to it, and that meaning we assign is going to make shape our reality. Okay, the meaning we give to things is going to shape our reality. If we have 
And let me let me explain on that a little bit. So every and depending on who you want to follow, who you want to read, who what book you you subscribe to, at any given moment we literally have two billion pieces of information that's processing through our brain. Okay, we have things that we're taking in visually. We have auditory things we're taking in. We're taking in smells. We're taking in tastes. We're taking in things kinesthetically. Right now. You guys are all taking in information. Some of you are going to be focusing more on my voice. Some of you are going to be focusing more on the pictures behind me. Some of you noticing my clothes, saying, oh, Jesse's wearing a collared shirt today, right? Some of you are going to be focusing more on jokes and whatnot. And if I were to stop this right now, have all of you close your eyes and say, what do you remember? What did you notice? Each person is going to come back with a different description about what they noticed. Okay, and if I took it a step further and I said, okay, everybody close their eyes, what color is the lamp? A lot of you probably don't even notice the lamp. Some of you do, and if you did, you didn't notice the color. Some of you might notice it right away because that's what you're focusing on. Okay, so what that means is we all have all this information that's going through our sensories, going through our senses, our, no, our smell, our eyesight, our ears, how we feel, okay? And what we do when that information comes in we do go through a process of what's called deletion and distortion, meaning we delete out relevant, we delete out information that our unconscious mind deems is irrelevant. We say, okay, I don't need this, I don't need this, I don't need this to make up the whole picture. And then what comes out is how we interpret what we're seeing and experiencing. And that's the meaning we ultimately give. So that's why some people will notice a shirt, some people might notice pictures, some people might notice all of it. Because how we interpret stuff, how we experience reality is influenced by life experiences we've all had and how we've chosen to experience those experiences and the meaning we've given those experiences. And it's also influenced by our present emotional state. Okay, somebody who is watching this right now and who has had an amazing day and is wonderful and has had great things is going to probably listen to my jokes and laugh at them. Somebody who's watching this and might not have had the greatest day might hear some of my jokes and think, oh, that was dumb. Who is this guy? Right? Somebody who comes here with the intention and desire to learn is going to be more open and receptive to what I have to offer. Some person who shows up and it sits here like this the whole time and is, is here only to try to argue with what I have to say is going to get a completely different experience out of it than the person who shows up open to learn. Does this make sense? And I say this is so important because what this means is that we have the ability to alter our reality depending on how, what experiences, how the meaning we decide to give to experiences. Okay, so the two billion pieces of information comes in. We delete and distort what we don't think is relevant, and we spit out. We focus on about 126 of those two million pieces, and we use those 126 pieces to create our reality. So obviously. It goes without saying that that's a very small piece of all the information available to us and what pieces we choose to make up those 126 little pieces are going to radically affect our lives. Having said that, I say this and I wanted to talk about this today because this is such an important thing. In life, we have so many experiences happening at all times, right? We have so much stuff going on. We have world events, we have catastrophes, we have tax deadlines, right? Was it yesterday? What is today? Tuesday? Oh, yeah. Yesterday in the United States was tax day, right? Very stressful time for a lot of people. We have deadlines to make. We have bills to pay. We have health. We have sickness. We have makeups and breakups, and we have everything else in between. We have death. We have life. And all these experiences are going to be experiences that happen to us, but where life becomes a challenge is when those experiences happen and we decide a meaning on them that makes us a victim. When something happens and it's it's the we take the meaning as God, the universe, whoever is against us. When something happens and we become a victim, when something happens to us and we are in a place where we feel powerless and unable to do anything, okay, that is when our life can take a really bad spiral down because in that decision we make, in the meaning we assign to things, we become helpless. We become powerless. What I want you guys to take away, if you take away one thing today, if you just take away one key thing today, 
I want it to be this, that you all have the power to determine the meaning in your life, and with that power comes the possibility of creating whatever reality you want to live in, whatever reality you want to live in. And I'm sure I've told you guys this story before, but I'll, I'll use it as an example, and I tell it in the Six Weeks to Your Greatest You class a lot. You have two people, and these two people are the exact same. They look exactly the same. They're, they're, they're guys. They're, let's say, 30 years old. They're dressed up in a nice suit. They're walking down a busy street, you know, kind of like a New York City type street, and they're wearing the exact same clothes. They're carrying the exact same briefcase, and they're walking around, and they're going through, and it's rush hour. You know, there's all these people everywhere. And as they're walking down the street, one guy gets ready to step off the bus, or gets ready to step off the curb, and this huge bus goes flying by. Okay? He gets ready to step, the bus goes flying by, and it hits a puddle and splashes mud all over him. And the guy sits there and he gets so angry, he gets so upset, and he's like, oh, he steps up, he's like, ah, damn. Rrr, 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 rrr. You can see that guy, he didn't pay attention where he's going. Now look at me, it's ruined my suit, my briefcase. This suit cost me $500, you know, blah, 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 blah. Oh, this is going to be the worst day ever. The guy turns and he starts stomping down the street, and every time he looks at somebody, he makes eye contact. He looks at them and he thinks, that person is looking at me, that person is judging me, that person is mocking my ruined suit. Oh, everybody's sitting there just looking at me now, everybody's making fun of me. God, this is horrible. And so he goes, he goes, he goes storming down the street. He goes storming down the street, and he gets to his office, and he walks in, and he's greeted by the, 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 the secretary, and he sees her look up and down at him, and he thinks, oh, she's just judging me. And he doesn't even look at her. She's smiling. He doesn't even notice the smile because he's so focused on her eyes, her wandering eyes. He walks through and he doesn't acknowledge anybody. And he, in his mind, he thinks that all they're doing is staring at him. And so why would he want to talk to them anyways? He goes into his office. He sits down. He sees this huge pile of work on his desk. He sits there and thinks, gosh, this is the worst day to have all this happen. Look at all this work I have to deal with. I can't believe there's all this work to deal with this day. This is miserable. He gets to the day. He goes through the work. He gets home, or he goes to head home, and he gets in his car. And when he gets in his car, he gets in traffic. And he's just sitting there, oh, man, traffic. It figures. And there's no way I wouldn't have traffic today. Worst day already, throw in the traffic. So he inches along on his way home. He gets home, and he walks in. He doesn't even acknowledge his wife. She's in the kitchen. She says hi. He says, I just don't want to talk. I need to go watch TV. This has been the worst day ever. I don't want to think. So he sits there, and he watches TV. He zones out. His wife's in there. She eats dinner by herself. They barely talk. They go to bed. She tries to say something. He says, I just want to go to sleep. I just want to forget this day. He goes to sleep, and as he's falling asleep, he's thinking about what a horrible day it was. As she's falling asleep, she feels horrible and powerless that she's not able to help him, and she feels that the relationship is growing apart. And he wakes up in the morning with his last thought the night before being, what a horrible day that is. And then what happens? He wakes up in the morning. With that as his last impression, he stubs his toe right from the get-go and starts it all over again. Meanwhile, we had our other guy looking exactly the same, dressed exactly the same, and walking down the street and gets ready to step up the corner. All of a sudden, the bus goes by. Whew, hits a puddle, splashes mud up all over him. The guy looks down in his suit, and he's got mud and dirt dripping all over him, and he looks down, and he takes a breath, and then he looks up, and he says, Thank you. Thank you. If I would have stepped forward a quarter of an inch faster, that bus would have hit me. I would have been killed. I missed, I missed dying by a split second of split seconds. This is the luckiest day of my life. And the guy steps back and he's dripping with mud and looks down and looks out all these mud he's got covered in his $500 suit and he starts laughing. He starts laughing because he's, he can't stop touching himself because he's so, he feels so alive in that moment. And he walks down the street, and he sees everybody looking at him, and he just can't stop smiling. And he's thinking in his mind, boy, these people must look at me and think, what is this guy covered in mud smiling about? I want some of what he, want, he has. He goes into work, and he sees his secretary smiling. He smiles back at her, and he just stops and says, you know what? I'm, I just want you to know how thankful I am that you work here. He walks through the office, and he waves to everybody, and goes in and sits down at his desk, and he sees this huge power of work, and he looks at it and says, wow, I'm so grateful to have all this work and have all this opportunity in front of me. He makes it through the day and has one of the most amazing days ever. He can't stop smiling. He's so focused. He's so productive. He's interacting with his coworkers and his, and his clients in a way he never has because he's so focused on how great it is to be alive 
that he's connecting to a part of himself that is committed to providing higher value to the people he works with. He goes to get in his car to drive home, and he's in. he hits traffic, and he thinks, you know, normally traffic would bug me, but right now, I never thought I would like it, but I do. I'm enjoying traffic. It just gives me time to reflect on life and reflect on all the wonderful things I have to be grateful for. So he inches along, and he gets home, and he walks in. His wife's in the kitchen cooking dinner, and he goes up to her, and he gives her a huge hug and kiss and says, Honey, I love you so much. I'm so thankful for you. And so they sit down at the table together, and they light candles, and they sit there, and they talk for hours, and they enjoy a meal together. And when they go to bed that night, they make love and they go to sleep saying, God, this is the most amazing day ever. And they fall asleep holding each other, connecting, loving one another. And his last thought he thinks before he falls asleep is, one, how much he loves his wife, but two, what a wonderful day he had. And then when he wakes up in the morning, he wakes up really appreciating how grateful he is to be alive. Okay, so it's just two, the people are obviously the exact same person, but what happened was the meaning they gave to the event changed their whole reality. Right? The exact same thing happened, but in that moment of decision, the one guy took it as being that he was a victim. He went through his whole day looking for evidence to support how the world was against them, how horrible things were. And the other person looked at it as a gift, and he went through the whole day experiencing the whole day looking for evidence to remind him of that. Okay, so this is the power of meaning and your ability to choose it. When life happens, when challenging things happen in life, right, when there's sickness, when there's health, when there's whatever there is, you get to decide the meaning you put into it. It doesn't now, and this doesn't mean, let me be clear, this doesn't mean that you're not sad, you don't get angry, you don't get upset. That's all part of life. But what it does mean is when you are sad, you don't become sadness. When you're angry, you don't become anger. You allow yourself to feel the emotions, but then you look at the event for what it was, and you decide what meaning you want this event to have in your life. Do you want it to be an event that is caused for you to be a victim the rest of your life? Do you want it to be an event that is caused for you to never move forward, to always hold back, to not love as greatly as you could have? Or do you want it to be something that becomes the motivator for you to change, to be able to look at it and say, gosh, you know, there's some opportunity here for me to grow. There's some opportunity for me to stop and be grateful. You know, maybe there's some things I wasn't focusing on. I know that Jesse guy, he said, he said there's 2 billion pieces of information coming in, and I'm only noticing 126 of them. Maybe I need to adjust those 126 I'm noticing. If I adjusted those 126 I'm noticing, maybe my life would change. If I adjusted those 126 things up and I started looking at things a little different, maybe I could find more happiness. Maybe I could find more courage. Maybe I could find more love and adventure. Right? So... Your ability to decide on the meaning, the power you have to choose the meaning, is ultimately going to shape your life, is ultimately going to change your reality. Some ways to just, you know, let me give you a couple quick tips to, about changing meaning, and then we'll move on to question. One of the things I always like to tell clients is look for what may be there versus assuming what is. Okay? Look for what may be there instead of assuming what is. And what that means is, is when an event happens, right, we experience it, we go through, we delete, distort, we come out with whatever our representation of that event is. And then in that moment, we assume that we've experienced the whole event, we've seen, we've felt, we've touched, we've tasted, we've heard, all there is. And that our reality we're experiencing is the absolute reality. So stop and take a breath, and instead of assuming that's it, look around. See if you've noticed anything else. Think back and see if there's something you missed. Okay, ask yourself how the other person may be experiencing it. What could this mean? And this is something that, think about in relationships, right? If, I, I use these examples all the time in relationships because it's such a, it's such a traditional one. So the wife wants the husband to take out the garbage. Okay, he looks at the garbage and he's, he thinks of it as she's punishing him. The, the meaning he gives it is that she's punishing him because he was late or whatever, and he needs to take out the garbage. Where she's looking at it is it's just she likes to have a clean house. And that if he takes the garbage out, it's a sign of how much he loves her. Okay, so they're both looking at the same garbage can, but the meaning they're giving it to it is completely different on both ends. And having a different meaning like that, is that going to create conflict in the relationship? Absolutely. Definitely. So Part two, another tool you can use is when you're in a relationship or you're in a professional setting or any sort of setting, 
when there's more than one person involved, you guys have to stop and ask what meaning is the other person assigning it. And you don't say it, you, you don't necessarily have to say, well, honey, I know you want me to take the trash out, but what meaning are you giving to this trash can? Okay, you don't have to say it like that. They might think, well, what do you mean, what meaning? And then you say, oh, this Jesse guy was talking about this. And they might think, huh? Meaning, it's just a trash can. But no, no, ask her, why is that so important for you that I take the trash can out? You know, what, what, what is it, how does it make you feel when I do take it out? And how does it make you feel when I don't take it out? And allow her to explain, okay? That allows you to understand where the other person is coming from. And so then your meanings, your realities that you create can start to match. Make sense? Okay, so just a quick review. Remember, we started off with the story about the old woman and the pot roast. People were cutting the ends off. They had been passed down for generations. And it turns out that there was no real rhyme or reason for it. She just did it to get the fit in her oven. But the meaning everybody else took from it was that that was the key to success. That was the key to making an amazing pot roast. We all experience the world differently. Each and every one of us is processing 2 million pieces of information at once. Different people on here are noticing different things. Some of you are noticing my shirt. Some of you are noticing my skin tone. Some of you are noticing the door behind me, the pictures behind me, the lamp, right? Some of you are focused more on my voice or my gesturing. All of that is going to allow you, so you guys are taking that in, you delete and distort what comes in, and then you spit out basically what your representation of what's going on is. Some of you may have a noise in the background, and that distracts you from focusing on what's going on here. Okay, because we're always deleting and distorting things to create the reality that we're experiencing. And there's however many of us from around the world on this chat right now, and I promise you, each and every one of you is having a different experience in this. Okay, that experience, our reality is created by previous life experiences and the meaning we gave to those experiences and the emotional state we're in. So I gave the example earlier, if somebody comes in here and they're happy, they've had a wonderful day, they are going to get something completely different out of this chat than somebody who comes in here and is angry and pissed off, and they're coming here looking for a way to try to disprove what I'm trying to say. Okay, Those people are in two completely different emotional states. They will experience two completely different realities, even though I am saying the same thing to both people. It's just how they're choosing to interpret it. The idea of meaning, the concept of meaning is extremely important because what it means is it means you have the power to change your reality, you have the power to choose if you're going to be a victim or a victor. You have the power to interpret an event that happens, an experience that happens, and then use it to learn, to grow from. You have the power to bring more happiness, more joy in your life. You have the power to find more courage to make changes that you want to make. Okay, so that's why meaning is so important is you have the power to do this. And then a couple little tips for meaning, a couple little keys to help you change the meaning. One, look for what might be there instead of assuming that you've seen it all. Okay, so look past what your initial picture is and ask yourself some questions. Hmm, what else did I see? What else did I hear? If there's more than one person involved, think about it from their perspective. Ask them what something means to you. I gave the example of the wife asking her husband to take out the trash. And the husband can ask her, you know, hey, honey, what does it mean to you? Why is it important for you that I help you, I take out the trash? What does that, how does that make you feel? Okay. And if you guys are struggling to change, as always, with anything, get accountability buddies, right? Get accountability buddies to help you. Talk to a friend. Tell them this is what you want to change. You want to start focusing more on this way. Help them hold you accountable. If you're struggling with health goals, look, get enlisted professional help. If you're, if you're struggling for, if you feel like you're stuck in trying to learn a new language, instead of sitting there telling yourself, I can't do this because that's the meaning you give it, look for ways that you can do it. You know, hire a tutor. Look on a, a website. There's going to be people on there that would love to probably partner up and learn your language, and then you learn their language, and you guys tutor each other. Okay, so the possibilities are endless of how you can do this in a positive way when you accept that you have the power to shape your reality. Okay, that is what I have for you guys. Uh, please ask questions now. Thank you so much for being patient. Let's see those questions. I'm going to take a sip. Questions, questions, who's got some questions?
this is that awkward moment in the chat when I'm sitting here with the delay waiting for all your questions to pop up. And so I sit here and fidget and I wait. And then all of a sudden the questions start coming up and then I can't catch up to them. Will you post on Facebook your recipe for your wonderful smoothies? Uh, there's a YouTube video for it, actually. I think if you go to my YouTube channel and you can you can find it on there, and I think I explained how to do it all. And if there's not, let me know, and I can definitely make sure that gets there. Perception is key. We can't control everything that happens to us, but we do have the ability to control how we react. That is my takeaway from this. Absolutely. Your perception is key. I mean, we all are going to have a moment of decision in life with everything we experience. And those moments of decision, what we decide, that shapes our life. And people start making decisions over and over again to be a victim over and over again. Guess what? Your whole life's a victim. And the smallest of things from getting up and going and getting the newspaper becomes a chore. Oh, okay, now we have all the questions coming up. What is coming up for the future? Any more books? Yes, I am working working on a book about the Thousand Challenge, and hopefully that will be something that is done in the next year or so. I keep kind of setting it aside because I want to work on this project or I want to work on this project, but that's definitely on the plate. What do I fear most about my health? You know, it's funny, I... I don't know how many of you know, but I've um, last several years I've had you know for as healthy as I've am I've had quite a few health challenges I've had I've had to have two minor surgeries both surgeries had well not both of them the first one had quite a bit of complications from it that really impacted my health and left me in quite a bit of pain for almost a year and then in addition to that I've had I don't know if it's a I can't remember if it's a bulging disc or a herniated disc for the last probably year and a half. And so you guys might see me fidgeting a lot. It's just because it gets uncomfortable for me to sit. It is improving. For a while, I could not bend past my, my right side. But I haven't really been able to hike much. I haven't been able to run much. That's why, you know, you guys haven't really seen a lot of hiking pictures over the years for the last year and a half because what would happen is after I'd hike for maybe more than 20 minutes, my whole back would lock up and I wouldn't be able to bend over to get in the car. It is finally improving, and so one of my fears has been, you know, going through these these health challenges the last few years is, is if I don't improve now, how would it deteriorate? And having that thought process has really strengthened my resolve to do things a little differently, and which I'm really grateful for because I have the opportunity to address these things while I'm young, and then live a, a really healthy, pain-free life for the rest of my life, as opposed to allowing the problem to go on more and more and then get to a point where it's going to be a lot harder. Okay, we have a lot of questions popping up now. Um, 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 um. What inspired you to take the path in life that you have as far as life coaching and personal fitness? Just life experiences. You know, I when I went through... I was always the shy, I mean, if you guys would have known me 12 years ago, I was the most shy, most insecure person you ever met. I mean, it was literally turned bright red in the face. If anybody talked to me, I, I would have a dialogue with myself daily about how ugly I was, how worthless I was, I mean, all these things. And as I started to change, go through some changes for myself, and I'm just giving you the abbreviated version now just so I can get to questions, I started to realize how much the changes I made for myself was impacting my life. And it started with fitness. And so I thought, you know, I really wanted to help show people that. And I started doing training. And then when I was with training, I, I found that it was really intuitive with people. And I also got to a point where fitness, I was frustrated because I couldn't help people as fast as I wanted to. And I start, really started to delve into studying people. You know, why we do what we do, why we think what we think, how we feel what we feel. And from life experiences and going through, you know, some tragedies in my life and some struggles, I really started to understand humanity and just in a way that I think most people may not necessarily have had the opportunity to. And I just wanted to help people. You know, I've always, always wanted to help people. And just I wanted to help people be happy. I wanted to help people live their best possible lives. And that's what ultimately brought me to where I am right now, talking, talking with you all. 
Um, the outcome to your story about after deletion and distortion has brought me to core beliefs question is what do you think about core beliefs and what do you do to change them? I think core beliefs are huge. Core beliefs are, and for those of you who aren't familiar with the term core beliefs, it's basically the key beliefs that make up your reality of the world. And the beliefs that you choose to believe are going to have a lot to do with the life that you live. This is why for little kids it can be so heartbreaking when Santa, they find out Santa isn't real because they're, one of their core beliefs they have is that every year on December 24th there's going to be a, a jolly old fat man in a red suit coming down the chimney bringing them presents. So what do you do to change their core beliefs? You have to, you know, to change your core beliefs, you have to ask yourself what beliefs would better serve you. You, you want to uncover why you have the beliefs you have first because there's a reason you have those beliefs. Once you have a clarity about why you have those beliefs, it's going to be much easier for you to change them. The challenge is, is not so much in changing the beliefs, it's understanding why you have the beliefs you have right now. Once you can do that, you're going to be able to change them. And you have to you change them by asking yourself what's important to you, what do you value, how can you make your life better, what do you need to do to make your life better. Really powerful questions like that will help you do that. Good question. How do you stop a fall down a snowy hill when you can't get your ice axe to stop you even when you keep striking at the ground as hard as you can? You are free falling. How do you stop? Uh, I can't really answer that question because I am not much of a mountaineer. So if there is anybody on here who is a mountaineer and would love to answer that, that would be great. What motivated you to start the One Year 1000 Challenge? Uh, I There's a blog. I have one of my blogs on it. And I really encourage you to read it because it explains all that. But the short answer is is... The, my friend's suicide and then the death of my dad were so close together and you know just a bunch of other things happened in between and I'd gotten to a place where I was just I I would look in the mirror and I was so sad and upset and I really wanted to do something to to get myself to refocus on living and being happy you know I, I wasn't I figured realized I wasn't getting happy by sitting around being sad and so I wanted to change it how do you deal with people who think you are weird because you are looking at life in a positive way and have grown it's a good question. I just don't deal with them. You know, I just don't deal with them. If people want to look at me as weird, that's their choice. You know, if I if I spend my life, if I waste my precious energy spending a lot of it thinking about what other people think, then I'm going to miss I'm going to miss and more specifically thinking worrying about what other people think who really don't matter that much, then I'm going to take away from the time of being able to be present with the people who do matter most and being able to listen to what they have to say. And I'm just going to take away from my own happiness. And why would I want to give my happiness away to somebody who's going to sit there and judge me as being weird, right? And that's, that's their choice. And that's fine. They're totally entitled to that. But I'm just not going to deal with it. Why do you think that most people find it easier to focus on the negative than the positive? It's a great question because it's easy. I mean, it really is easy. You know, after after a couple things happen, after a couple challenges happen, it's really easy to become a victim. And what happens is when people become victims, they find other victims to commiserate with. You know, you know go on Facebook. Facebook's a great example of this. And you watch people when they post, you watch somebody who posts like a, a happy thing, and they'll get some decent feedback. You know, not like a big happy thing, not like a major life thing, but just saying something like, oh, I had a wonderful day today. And it'll get a little bit of feedback, but if somebody goes up there and puts, I had the worst day ever, uh, I had the worst day ever, they'll get a lot more feedback from it. And people get on there and say, oh, what's wrong? I'm so sorry, et cetera, et cetera. And what that person learns from that on an unconscious level is a way to get attention, a way to feel connected to people is by doing that. And so people become addicted to that behavior because they're meeting some sort of need that way. And it's an easy way to do it. Good question. How do you try and train yourself to think positive again after a huge loss? My mother recently passed, and I hate the person I am right now. That's a really good question. What I always try to focus on is what that person would want me, how that person would want me to live my life. And I remind myself every day that the way I choose to live my life is ultimately how I'm going to honor them. So if I, if I choose to live my life in a way that is not how they would have wanted me to live it, then I am dishonoring that person. 
But if I choose to live my life and live it in a way that they would have wanted me to, and not only that, but I give meaning to their death that I'm going to be making an even bigger intention to make the most out of my life, that really shifts things around for me. So for your mom, you remind yourself the meaning that you want to give to your mom's death and how you ultimately want to honor her. The way you honor her is by living and making her death have a powerful meaning on you to live as opposed to, you know, not. And I understand, you know, when it just recently passed, you're going to go through the grieving process. You're going to be sad. But what's really important is as you go through that process, you're not becoming sadness. You experience the emotion, but you know that you can move forward with it. Good question. I'm making a major change in my life as to my health and being overweight. How do I keep on the right track as I fail at it so much? You get get. You, I think the most important thing is get an accountability system. Get some accountability buddies there. It makes all the difference in the world. Uh, if you want, shoot me an email. I have a an accountability group that there's probably I don't know how many members are in it, but it's awesome. And everybody's checking in with each other all the time. It's it's a global group, so there's always somebody on there. You know, pretty much 24 hours a day. And I think that helps having, you know, telling friends, family that you're going to do this and why you're going to do it, it makes a huge difference. As well as, you know, give yourself a bigger motivator for why you're doing it. You know, a lot of times people just say, I want to lose weight to lose weight or I want to get in shape just to get in shape. But give yourself a compelling reason why. Why do you want to do that? Good question. Anything else? Questions, questions. We have about five more minutes of questions, and then we'll. Good questions, you guys, too. I appreciate you asking them. Uh oh, now they all just come in all of a sudden. <laughs> okay. How do we go about finding our own value? How do we go about finding and maintaining our own value? It's, it's getting clarity for what's really important to you. You know, so often people aren't willing to ask themselves those tough questions. And even, even then they don't necessarily articulate all the time. And you guys, it's something I, I, I challenge myself with all the time. You know, we all only have the ability to consciously focus on so many things. And there is times where some of the things that are most important to me, I don't maybe give them the attention that I would like to give it to. Or I think I'm giving it attention and I'm not giving it as much attention as I really wish I was. So you have to constantly remind yourself. And if you struggle with thinking about it, write it down. Write it down. There is no shame in writing down something like every day you write down on a piece of paper and put it on your mirror. Make sure I kiss my wife today and tell her I love you. Because it seems like it should be something that should be automatic, but it's not for a lot of us. Like We have to think. Everybody's going to be have different ways of thinking and feeling. And we have to help remind ourselves of the behaviors we want to change if we want to change those behaviors. I'm the person that one bad thing sets a tone for the entire day. Uh, well, Kelly, I think you will enjoy the, the little treat I have for you all then. How do you change people's perceptions of who, you th who they think you are? Is it worth exploring or is there an issue to do with? You can't really change people. I mean, and if you're going to put your time and energy into trying to change people, then you're not able to change yourself, right? So all that you can do is try to change yourself in whatever way you want to change. Be the best you can. Work on your own self-perception. And as you do that, the perception of others aren't going to matter as much. I feel like I do look at things with a positive outlook, but then I get influenced with others and their negativity. How would I get past their negative comments and energy, especially in my work environment? Good question. You just, you know, you have to have it as water under the bridge. You know, and remind yourself, instead of taking their interpretation, interpreting it literally, remember this goes back to deletion and distortion, ask yourself, where does this come from? Why are they being negative? You know, think about what might be going on in their life that causes them to say that. Right? They may be experiencing a lot of pain. They may be having a lot of challenges in life, and that's just where it comes from. You know, and so if you subscribe to that and allow it to affect you, then it feeds into their reality. 
But if you do the opposite and you maintain a positive outlook in a in a a constant happy state, that helps influence them in some way, shape, or form. Good question. Uh oh, we just got a bunch more. Okay, guys, all the questions that have been typed so far, these are all the time we're gonna have questions for. So no more typing questions now. Okay, I, I want to try to answer as many of these as I can before we wrap up. Um, 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 wow, there's just came a ton of them in. <laughs> it's funny, there's a little delay, and then I think literally 30 questions just popped up. Oh, okay. What Santa isn't real? I Santa still is real in my mind. I'm turning into a slightly jaded person. I always help people however I'm able, but lately it just comes back to bite me. I'm trying not to dislike humanity just because of a few, but what can a oh, last little part pop. Oh, what can I do to help me? You have to ask yourself why you're trying to help people. If you're if you're if you're helping people and it's coming back to bite you, my gut instinct would be that you're helping people with the expectation that they're going to acknowledge it or show some sort of gratitude for you for it. And so in that, you're kind of giving yourself a double-edged sword. And you might be you might be selectively helping people that are not going to be ones that are going to do that. So a couple things. One, you can shift your focus and focus on helping people that will show that gratitude. Or two, focus on focus on helping people just from a place of love with no expectation of anything in return. And if you do that, then you're going to be able to enjoy the process of helping people. Good question. What would be the best way to break through fear? Uh, that's a really good question. It, you know, it depends on the fear. It depends on the fear. It depends on how what you want to do to try to face it, but I really think the best thing to do is just go forth and do whatever it is you're afraid of, within reason, <laughs> okay? What about negative people around you who stops you from changing your reality? Translate. What about negative people around you who stops you from changing your reality? Okay, that's a really good question, and my response is this. Do these people have a gun to your head? Because unless they have a gun to your head, they cannot force you to change your reality. You get to do that. You have the power to. You, however, can allow them to influence you, which I think is what's happening here. So you guys remember this. Unless somebody has a gun to your head and is telling you, hey, if you don't change and start thinking this way, I'm going to kill you, you get to make the meaning for your life. Okay, You have the power. You have the power. And even in that scenario, even in an extreme scenario like that where the person's pulling a gun to your head, you still can choose how you view that situation. Okay? Um, 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 um. Okay, you guys, I have quite time for two more questions and then I gotta wrap it up. Let me. Trying to pull up two questions. Um, I think I kind of answered that one. Okay, I have a seminar coming up, and I'm not looking forward to it because I'm always worried about what they think about me. I hate that feeling. How how have you dealt with this in the past? That's a great question. You know, and I, I'm one of those people that I will definitely get in my head sometimes when I go to seminars. I was just at a seminar this last weekend. It was a four-day one. And you're around a lot of people. And, you know, everybody, and this is what I'm going to say, everybody always goes in there with a story. Everybody always goes in there and has their interpretation and has their thoughts that come up. I definitely do, you know, and I would I would love to say that I'm beyond that, but it's not. I go in there and I have my own thoughts, my own fears, my own judgments of people. Oh, that person looks like this. That person must be this way. That person must be that way. Okay? So go when you go into it, remind yourself that everybody's going to be thinking and experiencing the same thing you are, so you're definitely not alone in that. And then focus on the main reason why you're at that seminar. You know, what is the what do you want to get out of that? 
you're, the reason for being there is not to allow people to influence you. It's because you're there to try to grow, to try to evolve. So set that as your intention before going in, and it'll really make a big difference. Okay, so I got two more questions, and I really apologize that I'm not going to be able to answer all these questions uh, because you have some really good ones on here. I just want to try to I want to try to get as many of these as possible, but I do have to be off here right at 6:30. Um, let me see. I'm having surgery done soon to my foot. How can I keep myself from gaining the weight back? Great question. Anytime you have a surgery, you know, obviously lifestyle changes. One thing that happens is after post-surgery is you get to control what goes in your mouth, and what goes in your mouth is going to make a huge, is going to set a huge standard for the weight you may or may not gain. So, you know, prep yourself beforehand. Don't put anything in your house that you do not want to eat. Snack food, temptation food, do not put it in your house. Only have food there that is going to be healthy and keep you on track. And then also remember, just because you're having surgery on your foot doesn't mean you can't move your upper body. You know, you can get a set of dumbbells, get a bands, and do some movements, even while you're sitting on the couch recovering. There's a, lots of things that you can do. <laughs> this is kind of a funny one to end on, so this is perfect. How is your neighbor? She already found out how nice you are. <laughs> I don't know. You know, I haven't seen my neighbor for a while. The last time I saw her was a couple weeks ago, and I was driving down, and I saw her kind of glare at me, and then she was waving like this, and I just waved back, and I think she wanted to pull. She wanted me to pull over so she could yell at me, and I just smiled and kept waving because I was running late to meet an appointment. So, okay, guys, thank you so much for your time. So the little prize I had for you guys, those of you who are here. So what I wanted to do is because I want you guys to all know that I am super, super, super committed to you all and helping you guys make this spring an amazing one, to helping you change the, the meaning you assign to things, and really helping you guys make this year your best year. So what I want to offer to you all is a free, a free, a free 30-minute consultation with me about, we can go over some of these things. We can meet one-on-one -on -one over Skype and talk about you know, some different strategies that you can employ into your life to help you improve your life. Okay, now here's the deal with this. Because my availability is super limited and I only want to use this time with people who are very motivated to utilize it, I'm going to put a link on here, and this is going to go out to whoever fills out the form and sends it back to me within the next first two hours. Okay, so you guys have a two-hour window to, op to capitalize on this opportunity. What I need you to do is when you're filling out the form, I need you to mention somewhere in there that you are taking advantage of the 30-minute offer that I offered on here. Okay, and then fill out the form. And you need to fill it out as honestly as possible. Okay, I will get a hold of you then, and we can coordinate about meeting. But again, this offer is only for people who are really serious and committed about wanting to make some changes in their life and who want to get some help about it and people who are motivated to doing it. So this is only going to be open for two hours. So if I get an email at 6.30 almost right now, 8.30 Pacific time, anything that comes in after that will not be eligible. Okay? So I am going to put a link below, and that is it. You guys, thank you so much for being an awesome group. I really, really, really appreciate it. Oh, comments can't contain links. Put, please put your link in the video description. Okay. I will put the link in the video description because it says I can't put a link in the comment thing. So I will put a link in the video description on here. So if you guys all want to stay on here after this ends, I'm going to put this in here right now. And you guys have been an amazing group. I'm going to stop recording. And I will look forward to chatting with you all again soon. Okay?